Welcome again, and in this session, we're going to be reading Matthew chapter 21. We're going to be talking about the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. We're going to be talking about Jesus cleansing the temple. We're going to be talking about how the fig tree was cursed, how Jesus' authority was questioned, the parable of the two sons, and the parable of the tenants in the vineyards. So let's get started. We're going to start off with uh, verse 1. Follow along with me, Matthew, Matthew, excuse me, chapter 21, verse 1. When they came near to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and came to Bethphage, now it says here that some manuscripts say that, uh, say Bethphage instead of Bethsphage, just to be precise. So when they came near to Jerusalem, and came near to Bethsphage, to the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying, Go into the village that is opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. So there's the donkey and the colt. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them. And immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Sion, Behold, your king comes to you, humble, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This is in Zechariah, Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9. Verse 6. The disciples went and did just as Jesus commanded them and brought the donkey and the colt, and laid their, their clothes on them. Wouldn't you like to lay your clothes on the animal that Jesus is, is riding? And he sat on them. Verse 8, a very, a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. You imagine that, having a piece of clothing where you can say, you know, the Lord of heaven and earth walked on this, or tread on this, or traveled on this clothes. <laughs> Walked on this close. He was riding a donkey or colt that was actually treading upon this close. A very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. So this is an act of showing homage or honor to a king. Okay. Others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Now, today, uh, in many churches, they hand out, let's say, you know, for example, Palm Sunday. This is what... This is what it's uh, talking about here, basically Palm Sunday. In a lot of churches, they hand out, you know, like fern leaves and this kind of stuff. Does not say that specifically here. It says they cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The multitudes went in front of him, and those who followed kept shouting, Hosanna, or Hosanna, which means save us or Help us, we pray. Hoshiana to the son of David. Again, for those of you who are following uh, the video series, I apologize for saying this so much, but there's I'm um, for the sake of those who are watching this, for for uh, for the sake of those who are listening to this uh, this teaching in this session uh, for the first time. The, the term son of David is a very, very clear uh, indication of the Messiah. Okay, back in those days, even today, most of the Jewish world, if not all of the Jewish world, when you say, who's the son of David? Or what is the Messiah? What are the other terms for Messiah? They will tell you, son of David. So the term son of David and Messiah, it, it's interchangeable. Uh, people understood when you said son of David, they understood you're talking about the Mashiach, the Messiah. Okay. Why? Because, you know, we read, we read in, in the book of Samuel that Nathan, the prophet prophesied to David that his descendant will, will, will inherit a throne that is in a kingdom that will last forever. And this is talking about the Messiah. Everybody who knows that scripture well enough to know what it's talking about knows that it's talking about the Messiah. Even the Jewish people today, even the non-Messianic Jewish people today will tell you that, that the son of David, the term son of David is speaking about Messiah. So these people, we were calling out 
for Yeshua to save them. And they were acknowledging him as the son of David. It doesn't say that anybody here refuted that. Okay, um, I, I read about one um, person who was of Jew, Jewish lineage, uh, an unbelieving Jew at that, um, was saying that Jesus was not the son of David. So, um, so he can't be the Messiah. Well, hey, look at all the times. You know, it's recorded that people called him son of David. Not even once was that refuted. Not once did anybody ever stand up. Did anybody ever refute that? We've got in many other parts of Scripture, many other things that Je- that was that Jesus was refuted. And we're going to read about his authority refuted later. But that title, son of David, was never refuted by anyone, even the Pharisees, okay? There's no one, no one said, oh, he's not the son. Because you see, they knew who his mother was, you know, and they knew who his father or stepfather, however you want to look at it, was. They knew that these people were from the line of David, okay? So they, they knew he was the son of David. So I'm sure they were probably thinking, son of David, well, we know that he is a son of David, but is he the son of David? Let's continue. These people were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Okay. And this is a direct quote out of Psalm 118 verse 26. Verse 10. When he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was stirred up saying, who is this? The multitude said, this is the prophet, the prophet. Okay, this is a very interesting phrase as well that a lot of Christians just completely, totally miss. You know, again, the phrase or the term the prophet is again referring to Messiah because Moshe, Moses prophesied of the Messiah coming, saying that there will come God will raise up among your brothers a prophet and you should listen to them or listen to him, that is. So Moshe, uh, Moshe, Moses was prophesying of one particular individual that was called a prophet that was obviously speaking of the Messiah. Okay. The multitude says, this is the prophet, Yeshua, from Nazareth of Galilee. Jesus entered into the temple of God and drove out all those who sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the money changers' tables and the seats of those who sold the doves. So can you imagine this? This is just like, now, I got to say this because it, it can be confusing to some Bible scholars. Here we got Yeshua going into the temple and cleaning the temple immediately after that triumphant ride. In the book of John, we've got Jesus going into the temple early, early on in his ministry, not at the end of his ministry like we like what we have here. Okay. What you need to understand is the way that ancient biographies worked was they did not always report things in a chronological fashion, okay? So when you, you, you got something that says this happened, then that happened, then the other thing happened in an ancient biography, it may not have may not be in that particular chronological order, okay? It may be the opposite way around. So they didn't really, they weren't really concerned about reporting things chronologically as opposed to just taking, you know, just uh, modules as, as it were, just kind of putting modules in a mosaic as it were uh, in, in a ancient biography. So yes, it does seem to flow really good here that uh, to say that Jesus after the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, after he was actually recognized or at least 
proclaimed to the to be the Messiah publicly. Uh, and right after that, being you know in such a, a, a an atmosphere of just praise, he goes in and just trashes the temple. Uh, again, this is the real Jesus. This is not the Je- this is not the meek, mild, you know, Huckleberry Hound kind of Jesus that just goes around saying, "Oh well, poor pity me." Well, you know what? Yeah, you just got all just love one another. You know, you got to bless one another. That's all. Just grace and love. That's all. It's what it's all about. Don't, you better not offend anybody. This is the real Jesus. This is the the real Jesus that went into the temple of God. Now, I have heard that the merchants in the temple in those days have it has been uh, said that the merchants in the temple of those days used to rip people off. They used to sell things as being you know, uh, have more, you know, value than they really were, they would rip people off, okay? They'd, they'd be they'd be known for just, just a bunch of rip-offs there in the temple. And that could have been, you know, uh, one of the driving factors here that Jesus, uh, that really fueled his anger. But obviously, Yeshua had a lot of anger here. He just stormed into the temple of God, it says here, and drove out all those who sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the money changers' tables and the seats of those who sold doves. In another uh, account of this story, we've got in another one of the Gospels where it says he actually made a whip and and used that whip uh, to drive them out. Okay, Verse 13, He said to them, It is written, My house... Oh, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And that is in Yeshiahu, Isaiah 56, verse 7. But you have made it a den of robbers. And that is exactly what Jeremiah, or Jeremiah, chapter 7, verse 11 says. Okay, so Yeshua, Jesus is really just... He is really just knocking off these prophecies one after another after another. He is really becoming the embodiment of the Word of God here. Verse 14. The lame and the blind came to him in the temple, and he healed them. When the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and that the children who were crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna or Hoshiana! To the son of David, Ben David. They were indignant. Why were they indignant? Indignant. Why were they? Why were they so angry? Why were the chief priests and the scribes so angry? Because the 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 children were crying out, "Hosanna to the son of David." Again, if you were to take this in context, if you were to take this, if you really, to, if you were to really know the real context of this. To say that he's the son of David and to cry out Hosanna, you are acknowledging and you are identifying him as the Messiah. You're saying, this is the Messiah. This is the Mashiach. And you're asking him to, to, to save you. That's why they were so indignant. They didn't like him to begin with because, you know, you know the way he was. He, he just didn't fit the profile that they were expecting. They didn't really fully understand the scriptures and the prophecies. And same way today with a lot of Christians. A lot of people today, they're looking forward to the second coming of Jesus. And they're looking for a meek, humble lamb. They're looking for the lamb. But what they're going to get is not a lamb. They're going to get a lion. It says when he comes back, he's going, to, he's going to be a lot, a lot of carnage. A lot. That is what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. Verse 16, And said to him, the chief priests and the scribes said to him, 
Do you hear what these are saying? Like, don't you understand what they're doing? They're praising you as the Messiah. They're asking you to, to save us. You got to stop them. You, you know you're not. We know you're not. Yeshua said to them, yes. Yes, I do hear what they're saying. Yes. Did you ever read out of the mouths of children and nursing babes you have perfected praise? So once again, Jesus added insult to injury. He rubbed it in their face. He, oh, I'm sorry to offend you. I didn't want to offend you. Oh, I, I mean, I'm just here for peace. Just here for peace. And that's what a lot of people think, that Jesus is just, just comes just for peace and for love. Out of the mouths of nursing babes, excuse me, you have perfected praise. He left them and went out of the, out of the city to Bethany and camped there. Can you imagine Jesus camping? Verse 18, now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. Jesus was hungry. Now, he, and Jesus had a thing about being hungry, okay? When he was hungry, he went out to the fields and he got his grain and he ate his grain, corn, you know, whatever it was, uh, on Shabbat, on the Sabbath. And then he said, whoa, don't you know what you're doing? You're breaking Shabbat. You, you are... You are um, you are defiling, you are violating Shabbat. Don't you know? But he says, basically, listen, I'm hungry. You need to understand. God says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. He was expecting fruit. He was expecting to eat. He said to it, there, let there be no fruit from you forever. Wow. That's a curse. Again, we've, we have Yeshua, Jesus, cursing something. This flies in the face of the evergreen tree huggers, does it not? Immediately the fig tree withered away. Jesus didn't go up to that fig tree and say, oh, you're my precious creation. Hug it and, oh, I love you, fig tree, like some people would today. This is the Lord of heaven. This is the Lord of heaven and earth. This is the God of all creation. Verse 20, when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, how did the fig tree Im immediately wither away, uh, wither away? How did that happen like that? Verse 21, Jesus answered them and said, Most certainly, I tell you. See, he always speaks with strength. He speaks with authority. Most certainly, I tell you. If you have faith and do not doubt, but will, uh, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you told this mountain be taken up and be cast into the sea, it would be done. All things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Wow. Isn't that awesome? Verse 23. When he had come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority do you do these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said, Jesus answered him and said, I will also ask you one question. See, he's not, he's not so soft. He's not so soft. He's not so, you know, apologizing for everything kind of a person. He said, I will ask you a question. Well, let me ask you one question. I'm not going to answer you. You answer me. Which of you, which if you tell me, I will likewise tell you by what authority I do these things. So he said, you asked me a question, I'm going to ask you a question. And I'm not going to answer your question till you answer my question. Verse 25, the baptism of John. Where was it from? From heaven or from men? 
That's a good question. That's a good question that everybody should be asking your favorite preacher. Is this guy from heaven or from men? Your favorite TV televangelist, is this guy from heaven or is this guy from men? And I know a lot of people wouldn't, wouldn't, a lot of people would not be able to honestly a- answer that question because they're so biased as it is and they're so deceived as it is. Not that every single person that shows himself on TV is deceived. I'm not saying that. But you got to be careful. Don't follow men. Follow Yeshua. What a good question. A question to ask about any leader in the church. Any leader, any spiritual leader. Is this, is this guy from heaven? Or from men? One or the other. They reasoned among themselves. They reasoned with themselves. I can see him just whispering. If we say from heaven, he'll ask us, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say for men, those that multitude's going to get us. They'll, they'll, they'll stone us. They'll kill us. We fear the multitude, for they all hold that John is a prophet. Verse 27, they answered Jesus and said, we don't know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. But what do you think? A man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he changed his mind and went. And then he came to the second son and he said to the same, he said the same thing, you know, go work in my vineyard. Go work today in my vineyard. And he said, I'm going, sir. But he didn't go. Which one of the two did the will of his father. Key word here, did. Jesus is drawing attention to, again, to what you do. They said to him the first. Jesus said, most certainly I tell you that tax collectors and prostitutes are entering into the kingdom of, into God's kingdom before you. (laughs) Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. Another sword in the gut. <laughs> Woo, he, that, that's pretty hot, guys. I mean, that's pretty hot. I'm, I mean, that's, that, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty heated conversation there. The words, out of, it, it was like fire on his tongue. Most certainly, I tell you that tax collectors and the prostitutes, I see, tax collectors were, 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 didn't have good reputation at all. They had the reputation of being real bad sinners. They were the ones that ripped people off all the time, stealing thieves, con artists. Most certainly I tell you that the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering into God's kingdom before you. Why? Why did he say that? Verse 32, For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you didn't believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. What does that mean? That means they repented, obviously. That was John's message, repentance. Jesus continued, When you saw it, you didn't even repent afterwards. That you might believe him. See, sometimes you got to repent before you believe. That's why it says repent, believe. Repent and believe. Once, a lot, of, a lot of times you believe what you believe or you don't believe what you don't believe because of your actions. You believe what you believe to justify your actions. Or you don't believe something to justify your actions. And this is the whole thing about athe- atheism, I believe, that atheism for the most part is not in- an intellectual thing. It's not. It's a moral thing according to God's law. If an athe- if a person is in line with God's law, it would be very, very hard to be an atheist. But if they were sinning, if they were in transgression against God's law, it would be much easier to be an atheist, wouldn't it? 
you got all the incentive to justify your lifestyle. Verse 33, here another parable. There was a man who was a master of a household who planted a vineyard. He set a hedge about it, dug a wine press in it, built a tower, leased it out to the farmers, and went into another country. When the season for fruit came near, he sent his servants to the farmers to receive his fruit. The farmers took his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they treated him the same way. Treated them the same way. But afterward, he sent them his son, saying, they will respect my son. But the farmers, when they saw the son, said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and seize his inheritance. They took him and threw him out of the vineyard and then killed him. When therefore the Lord of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those farmers? They told him he will miserably destroy those miserable men and will lease out the vineyard to other farmers who will give him the fruit in, in its season. Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected was made the head of the corner? This was from the Lord and it is marvelous in our eyes. Did you not read that? Psalm 118 verses 22 to 23. Let me just add here. Jesus says, if you look at it, over and over and over again, Jesus rebuked people for not reading the scriptures. If you call yourself a believer, if you go to church, if you call yourself a Christian, if you call yourself a believer, you have a responsibility to read the scriptures. Jesus expects you to know. Many times, to many people, he said, have you not read? Don't you know? Have you not read? Have you not read? Again in here. Did you never read in the scriptures? Like, you ought to do it. What's, what's wrong with you, bud? Verse 43, the words in red, Therefore I tell you, God's kingdom will be taken away from you. Oh, again. Wow. He's just swinging that sword left and right, isn't he? Jesus is not giving them any breaks here at all. Therefore, I tell you, God's kingdom will be taken away from you and will be given to a nation producing its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it will fall, it will scatter him as dust. Oh, lots to say about this. God's kingdom will be taken away from you and will be given to a nation producing, producing its fruit. Jesus was introducing the, the, the future here. He was introducing the gen to another nation being given the responsibility of the vineyard because of these unbelievers, these unbelievers and wicked people. They killed the prophets. They killed Yeshua. Yes, it has been taken away from them and it has been given to nations producing fruit. A lot of laws, may I add, a lot of laws of God are universal. They apply to everybody, everywhere. It doesn't matter what nation you're from. It doesn't matter what tribe, creed, what doesn't matter. It's like the law of gravity. It's universal. God's laws, His word, His instructions, His precepts, His, his judgments are universal. 
universal. They apply everywhere. Every they apply in all circumstances. They apply right across the board. He's not. A, he's not a god of double standard. Verse forty four. Listen to this. I said it. I'll read it again. He who falls. This is the words in red. The words of our Lord. He who falls on this stone. What stone do you think he's talking about? The stone the builders rejected. He just mentioned that. He's talking about himself. Yes. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. But he on whomever it will fall will be pound to dust. Would you rather be broken or nothing left of you but dust? When Jesus said, he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, he was talking about you. He was talking about you who humble yourself and fall upon the rock and you will be broken. Yes, your life will be broken. Yes, you will be broken. When you humble yourself and you, and you, and you fall on the rock, when you come down from arrogance, from pride, from vanity, when you fall down, when you're at the end of your rope and you let go and you fall on the rock, you will be broken to pieces. Humility, total, utter, complete, absolute humility. But he, on whomever it falls, will be smashed to smithereens, as they say. Smashed, it'd be nothing but Dust, not just smashed, dust. You got two options, two options. There's two kinds of people. One, the ones who are really humble, who will fall on the rock and and be broken in humility. Broken in humility. Then there are those who are given to pride. These are the people on whom Jesus will fall. It says in the scriptures over and over again in the Bible, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Isn't it interesting how so many people who are proud claim grace? But Jesus said, grace is only for the humble. Humble? You're humble enough to admit what you're doing is wrong? You're humble enough to admit your sin, to acknowledge your sin? You humble enough not to be offended when someone preaches against the sin that you're engrossed in? Humble. Humble enough to rejoice that you were corrected. Humble enough to bite the bullet. You'll be broken to pieces, yes. You'll be broken in humility. But at least you won't be pounded to dust. Because if you're on the other side, you'll be pounded to dust. Jesus will fall on you, and there'll be nothing left of you but dust. And may I add, the wind will blow you away. Verse 45, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he spoke about them. Ha ha! Yep, yep, that's right. About you and others. Everybody else throughout the ages as well. That's why we have it preserved today. Verse 46, when they... When they sought to seize him, they feared the multitudes because they considered him to be a prophet. Interesting how these chief priests and Pharisees were restrained for fear that the people considered him to be a prophet. The people considered John the Baptist to be a prophet. So they didn't want to say from men or else the people would be extremely upset with them. So that concludes our reading of Matthew chapter 21. May God give you rich blessings in the reading of his word, in the understanding of his word, enlighten the eyes of your heart and show you great and mighty 
marvelous things as you go and think about what we've just read. Meditate on his word all the time. Thank you.